Unspoiled Network podcast. Okay. This is Spoil Me, covering Mage Errant, Book 5, Siege of Skyhold, Chapters 15 through 19, The Grand Arc of History, Knock at the Door, The Battle of Dragon Claw Yardang, The Gravity of the Situation, and Burning Bridges. In these chapters, we have our battle popping off and everybody is getting to show off some of their new toys capabilities. And the one thing that I really wanted to see isn't resolved in this chapter, which is Godric going up against this dude who really is feeling himself. Calm down, sir. Welcome to Spoil Me. This is Spoil Me. Wait a minute. I did that part already. My God, you guys. Welcome to the show. I'm Natasha. I'm great. How are you? (laughs) Oh, Lord. I was editing an episode the other day where I did that then as well. I did the intro a second time. It was a different show. Been a difficult time for all of us. So these chapters, you guys, are kind of wild. First of all, we find out that the captain and first mate are actually Alustin and what is his name? Starts with a B. But and and I almost suggested B guy's name might be the one in disguise on the boat. But because we had that moment where Sabe says that she saw him. And Alustin's like, no, you didn't. Even if you think you did, you didn't. I was assuming he was being sent on a different, like, mission. Because the way that she saw him, I was thinking that it was him getting onto a different ship. And I shouldn't have thought that. There's no reason to think that, you know. But I guess I assumed that anybody who was, like, in disguise would have come down to the docks in disguise as well. And I suppose he didn't really, like, change his appearance until they got on the boat and made the agreement with the captain and first mate to, like, impersonate them. But that right there, big shock, didn't expect a lesson to be there. If he had sent somebody to keep an eye on them, that would have made sense to me. But him being here as well genuinely surprised me. And... The other thing in this section that I think is kind of compelling is the relationship between him and Valia, which we will go into later because that's like the last of these chapters. But there is a back and forth with them that is like, you know, it's really emphasized how often they've had this conversation and how it always goes the same way. And uh, I kind of appreciated that because I do feel like if you're dealing with somebody who has a real belief in something and if you encounter them over and over again, they will just keep trying to convince you, especially if they think that maybe what you're doing, you're doing because you don't know any better or you don't have all the information. They think that if they help educate you, then you'll change your mind. And uh, the fact that they have this history, I just thought was really sad, actually, in some ways. Um, And, you know, I'm going to back up and we'll talk about the beginning of this chapter. Chapter 15, The Grand Arc of History. So we start off right where we left off in the last chapter, where they like fell backwards off the balcony of the giant turtle shell that has like the throne room in it. And I guess it's just to stunt on him, you know? I was thinking that there was more of a a goal to be achieved. And they just really just kind of wanted to show off and be like, look at what we can do. 
I'm not really like mad about that so much as feeling like I don't really see that there was a whole lot of point here. I guess, you know, if he's just going to be so uh, recalcitrant, it's just giving him the finger a little bit for the satisfaction of it. And considering that evidently Alustin was like there for this and doesn't try and keep them from doing it. He didn't see any danger in it and was like, yeah, let's go for it. So they managed to uh, fall safely because even though at first his spell, Hugh's spell to like catch them doesn't work, it's because they're still within the field of the magic dampening enchantments. And once they keep falling and they get outside of that, then it begins to kick in and they're okay. And uh, there are some folks which they, all these people like stop in the street and point and are just like, what in the hell was that? Um, Hugh tells them immediately that there were invisible people in the room watching. And it turns out he can see invisible people. Which is wild. He's like, wasn't aware of it. You know, it's Godric who's like, wait, you can see them? And he's like, yeah, evidently. So it's because he was looking for the chameleons, you know, and he's just looking for them in the normal, like their camouflage sort of way. Not, I can't see them due to magic sort of way. And when they ask how many, he says like four or five. And who we realize later is Bandon says five and both Alustin and Sabe start cursing because they believe if there's five, that means that they are sacred swordsmen and that they are, you know, they travel in groups of five and that's likely what's happening. Godric tries to do the whole, like, well, we don't know that. And I was like, yeah, you kind of do though, guy, like, come on. So then, um, Alustin says, remember what the herdsman said, history is turning against Skyhold. You know who loves to use rhetoric filled with talk of the grand plan or the grand arc of history? Who believes that there is an inevitable pattern to history? Havath, Sepe said. And what I kind of, I want to point out here, and I understand that it's probably tricky to like utilize the wording so that you don't trip yourself up. But he says talk of the grand plan or the grand arc. And later on, Sabe protests when Godric uses the word plan and is like, no, they do not think there's a plan. That's very much not what they're saying. They emphasize that quite a bit. So the fact that it's also ever called the grand plan, I'm like, maybe that was a name given to their belief that is inaccurate, you know, which certainly fucking happens. Um, so they're, they talk about this. Sabe says that she's been reading about the Havathi a lot, trying to sort of understand how they think. And she thinks that, uh, she says they believe there are grand patterns in history, certain paths history inevitably takes like a flash flood in the desert, seeking out the same few canyons each time it reoccurs. The debris carried by the floods might change each time, but it's still carried along roughly the same paths. The debris in this case being the specific details of history. Basically, they believe that there's a deeper underlying pattern that history inevitably follows and that the differences are just superficial ones. They obviously also believe that the rise of a centralizing empire is inevitable and that their rise fits that deeper underlying pattern. And this is a really like interesting concept to me because the way that she describes a flash flood in the desert, seeking out the same few canyons, I, I always sort of use this as well because of something that, uh, from the Dresden files that there's a conversation that Dresden has with an archangel, I think. And they're talking about whether or not human beings can truly like change. And basically what the archangel says is like, oh, it's definitely possible. It's certainly possible for people to change, but it takes this kind of constant unending work that most people don't engage in. And he 
said, basically think of your behaviors and the patterns that you follow with the way that you tend to behave in a similar way. You respond similarly to certain situations over and over again. It's like you wear grooves into the ground and that's because you repeatedly are doing like similar things over and over. And therefore the water, which is your life, falls into those patterns because that is what you are repeatedly doing. And it's certainly possible to dig new trenches for the water to flow into, but it's difficult to do. You have to actively dig them. And meanwhile, there are these other trenches that already exist that the water is drawn to automatically. And you have to like dig them deep enough that the water goes there instead and maintain them so that they remain more attractive than the old ones. And that takes a lot of focus and a lot of repetition and work that frankly, a lot of us are just not up to because we're most of us trying to survive. And that's what we're focusing on is just getting by. So this makes sense to me in that way. Like the, the idea that human nature, if we're going to look at history as human nature, even though I acknowledge that in this universe, it's not just humans that count, but we'll go with that as just the, the name of this general concept of like conscious beings doing things according to their nature. I'm going to keep calling it that. Human nature is somewhat predictable. And the idea that we kind of fall into the same patterns over and over again is, in my mind, pretty accurate in certain ways. What's difficult is like, you know, because, for example, of the advances in technology over the past 50 years, we are looking at a landscape that feels totally different. And it's like, we're still dealing with human nature, but the tools that we're handling it with are so unknown and so different, even though a lot of them still accomplish the same things as the old ones, that it becomes a little bit more difficult to predict how that's going to shake out. In this universe, that's not exactly a factor. There are advances in magic and, and that's, important, but it doesn't necessarily like completely change. It's not a sea change, you know? So in my opinion, the idea that history tends to repeat itself, I think is correct. However, there's a difference between acknowledging that we fall into the same patterns over and over again and thinking that because we fall into the same patterns, we can just sort of like, I don't know, there's a, a an energy of like, they think that they can skip a step. Um, and the, they believe that the rise of a centralizing empire is inevitable and that their rise fits that deeper underlying pattern. It's like, oh, okay, well, I know that this thing has to happen. And obviously that's us. Uh, why though? Just because you think you get it doesn't mean that now you are the special one that just becomes the next big deal. And the fact that they are, th that they believe this thing, but they also are sort of functioning with the belief that like, we get it and other people don't, they seem to think that puts them in a totally different category. Like everybody else is getting played by the way things shake out, but we understand the truth. And it's like, it maybe, but does that change anything about the fact that it's just going to happen? They seem to think that knowing how a pattern generally works means that they can anticipate. And I don't know that those are the same thing, you know, especially because even if we're going with the idea that human nature falls into patterns that doesn't necessarily mean that the timing of it is at all predictable. That could be all over the place. Um, so 
Let's see. Talia says, what about the fall of empires? You'd think the fate of the Ithonian Empire would make them worry. And Sabe's like, that took a really long time. So they really are just like the Ithos' fall wasn't inevitable. It didn't fully understand the grand underlying pattern. And Havath can avoid that fate if they hew safely to that same pattern. They view Kandoran as an aberration, as some sort of awful monster from outside the flow of history. Which is interesting. Like, it feels to me like there's more to that. And we're not hearing it. And I am just going to keep coming back to how much do we really know or understand about Kandoran? I understand that the Athonians were fucking monstrous with the horrific experiments that they conducted, the wiping out of entire like peoples and languages, allowing folks to go mad because they had no language. Like all of this is truly a horror story. But that said, like, the fact that everybody is so, sort of holding up what Candoran did to the Ithonians and being like, this is evidence of how terrible she was. I'm like, is there more to this? Because they sounded like they needed putting down. They sounded like they were losing it and going over the edge into almost a fascistic state. And... If the Havathi are more concerned with the way that she handled that than what the Ithonians were doing, that doesn't speak super well for them. That said, again, going back to, it just feels like there's more to this story. It doesn't feel like it's as simple as anybody is making it out to be. And I'm not even sure how many of the folks that are like in this fight on the Havathi side really know the whole thing. I don't feel like Valia seems to. So... Anyway, um, Sabe says, that's what they do with everything inconvenient in history. Either label it as some freak event or as an irrelevant surface detail. The only reason their theories even seem consistent is that they presented a version of history rendered into reductive pap with more lies of omission than facts. They simply can't allow themselves to acknowledge that history is basically nothing but messy absurdities and that there is no inevitable path to it. Every shape will fit into a round hole if you carve it and hammer it enough. And I really appreciated that as well. Just being like, look, even if that were like a valid theory to go with, Anything that doesn't fit into it, they just completely act like it doesn't count. And man, is that a fucking thing. This is the problem with having like belief systems is if you want it to be a system, then you have to create rules that things fall into. And if you need it to really work, that means that you have to behave as if the rules are it and anything that isn't is somehow wrong or bad or unnatural and or you have to stay super limber and always account for the things that fall outside of it which kind of defeats the purpose of a system and makes everything so loosey-goosey that the folks who try to subscribe to systems in the first place who take comfort in the predictability of the rules they've been taught they're not going to be the sort of people who take kindly to having to switch the rules up and adjust them for whatever changes have happened. So, um, yeah, this is when Hugh is like, so is that what you've been doing is like figuring out how the Havathi think? And she says, partially, I'm trying to find a purpose. And Talia is like, I thought you were trying to become like more powerful. And she says, no, not that. That's what I want to be, not what I want to do. I got to thinking about what I actually wanted to do with the power after I got it. Having power means nothing if you don't use it. And if you use it without some greater purpose, you're only serving the interests of the power that already exists. 
Even if I were to somehow become a great power someday, without a purpose of my own, I'd just end up perpetuating the cycle of great powers battling for dominance, constantly threatening the lives of those weaker than them. There are plenty of nations that have remained stable for centuries without the, the you know, this setup. Um, and they seem to be at their limits. Their solutions have all failed when tried anywhere else. Even Havath's goal at its heart, an attempt to break free from the chaos of great powers. I mean, that makes sense to me. I get it. I want to find a purpose that frees me from this as well, but I don't know what it is. And everybody is like, girl, that's your purpose is to find a way out of that, to make it so that things aren't like this anymore. And she's just so taken aback that they have created such a grand purpose. She's like, no, 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 that's not what I mean. That's impossible. Like that's humongous. I, I, that's not something one person could even do. And Talia's like, well, looks like there's four of us here. So I guess that's good for you. And Talia, I love her so much just being like, yeah, no, we're definitely doing this. Like, I mean, she says any friendship whose end goal isn't bloody mass revolution seems like a pretty boring friendship to me. And I really want to get that on a t-shirt or something. <laughs> like... Fucking amen, Talia. <laughs> Swear to God. And Sabe is like, well, I'm being serious. And he was like, yeah, I think we all know that. We're also being serious. We've seen some shit as well, Sabe. It's not just you. And then they all sort of share things that they've known about or that have happened before they even met and the the stories that they've heard. Um, And... Emblin mentions how, uh, Emblin, Hugh mentions in Emblin, I was told nightmare stories about how horrible the world was outside our borders, how mages constantly ravaged and destroyed the land and everyone else huddled in terror at night. They were an exaggeration, but they weren't entirely wrong. And Godric says, I don't think literally anyone has ever liked the way things are. A lot of people say it's the only way things can be, but most of them are either great powers or beholden to them. It serves their interests to say things that say things can't change, which um, I definitely think is is tends to be true. But uh, I've been reading Ray Bearer, which deals a lot in like broken systems of government and the kinds of lies that get built up to make it seem as if this is just how it should be. And then you begin to find out, oh, that's not really how that works or how that happened or whatever. And there is a conversation that the main character, Tarisai, has with somebody who is sort of arguing a similar thing that like, this is just how the world is. And she says something that I kind of felt like I had been knocked between the eyes, which is, I think people are afraid that it could be better and that making it better will point out how it never needed to be this way, actually. And they will be faced with the fact that things can be improved, but simply were not improved because of inertia and they will bear some responsibility in that. And so they fear improving things because it will prove that their lack of action perpetuated it all. And they can't handle the like guilt of that, you know, and also just generally people don't like the concept of it's better now. And it could have been better this whole time. And it just wasn't. And we all lived like this. And that really reminded me of like the difference in the reactions that certain people had regarding student loans and how some folks were like, I'm so glad that the kids, you know, 
who haven't paid them off yet aren't going to have to go through what I did to pay mine back. And then there were people who were like, well, I paid mine back. I don't see why they should get special treatment. And somebody very rightfully compared that to like, what if you got cancer and, you know, you had to go through all of this like horrible treatment to become cancer free. And then they came up with a cure and you were bitter about the fact that they cured cancer for everybody else but you and just got really snotty about how everybody should go through chemo because you did. And it's honestly kind of a wild thing that our brains do sometimes where the fact that like we were in a particularly disadvantaged position, we decide that everybody should have been there also in order to really like experience life and it's like why do we always seem to think that it's the suffering that's important we always like there's just so many people out there who act as if like that's what builds character or how about we build character through being kind and generous to people and helping them but everybody acts like that's just being too nice and folks will get dependent, unquote, which is also a pretty crazy concept because dependent is what we are anyway. <laughs> like the, the concept that human beings function as islands is already so deeply flawed that to assert that people aren't already dependent on systems that are actively trying to fuck them is laughable. So anyway, I just really think that like the what Godric is saying is that a lot of people who think things can't change are either great powers or beholden to them. And I'm like, yeah. And then there are people who are, ha I think, have a secret fear that things could be better. And there's something so much scarier about knowing that we've been opting into this horror the whole time, you know, um, so anyway, this ends with all of them being like, yeah, obviously we are behind you, Sabe. Like, we're definitely going to do this. And uh, she's like, I, okay. I don't really have anything to say to that. So then we have this bit in 16 where Talia comes to Hugh's door. There's a moment where it's sort of like, oh, we're going to maybe make out. And then there's this knock, this like, on the side of the ship, this huge like swoosh of the, the ship moving because something has landed on it. And he's like, ah, oh, God damn it. To which Talia is like, Ooh, yay. Now we get to go and fight lizards. So this is when Hugh comes up on deck. He yells flare before he uses a star bolt. Uh, and he, it says the glowing energy blast lanced into the creature's shoulder instead of its head. And not even a second later, a massive dream fire bolt lanced into the creature's other shoulder. The star bolt just turned a chunk of the creature into a charred mess, but the dream fire bolt had turned the creature's other shoulder into a mass of teeth. Ew. I hate it. The chameleon let out an awful hiss and Godric's armor tumbled out of its mouth. And Godric, later on, it turns out he's in their mouths a couple more times and he is truly sick of it. He has the armor that will like save him, thank God. If anybody else had wound up in there, they would have been crushed. But they can apparently exert quite a bit of pressure and like weaken his armor. And if they do that repeatedly to a point, it's not going to be able to withstand it anymore. Um, so... Then a cloud of what looked like white birds launched into the lizard's mouth, severing its tongue and vanishing into the roof of its mouth. The chameleon shuddered, went still, then collapsed fully onto the deck. <sighs> there is something about the fact that they go up into the roof of its mouth. If, 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 you, if you struck its brain from the outside, you're accomplishing the same thing. So it shouldn't feel so wrong to destroy its brain this way but it does it feels so much worse <laughs> ew, 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 ew. um 
And this is when there's a mention, one of the alchemical explosives detonated early. And I do not know what this means. It's, it's brought up later in the scene where Alustin is talking to Valia and it's clearly like part of an overarching plan, but I don't know what that is. So this is the moment where he was like, wait, you're a paper mage. And he reveals himself and Bandon. Um, and we find out that fucking Sabe actually was aware the entire time that this was a lust in. So it, he had told her because he was like, I think that if she interpreted what we were doing as using you guys as bait, she would have been particularly pissed. So I really wanted to head off that accusation by like giving her a rundown of what we were planning to do. Um, so they have to like gather their wits here because the fact that they've been visited by one of these things means that there is more coming and there is a lot going on. And, uh, Hugh is set to ward the entrance of the cavern they're in. Godric seal off all the other entrances. Talia get up in the Drake's nest. Where's Sabe? And she comes out. She's all ready to go. And then we have Hugh trying to set, like, get the, the ward going. And there are wards in the docks to keep this from happening, which is apparently, like, to keep folks from docking, unloading, and then running off without paying. But when he finally, like, manages to work around it and ignite the ward, something hits it really hard and drains, like, a ton of the mana out of it. And he realizes that it's a fucking chameleon tongue. They're hitting the ship's ward from far away. And there's like a ton of them along the walls. And he's realizing like, okay, first of all, if I didn't have the ward up by the time that struck, I would definitely have died. And secondly, my ward is not going to be able to take all of these hits from the number of lizards that are in here. Um, and he goes and tells them, which like all of the preparations they had just made have to be undone. And Alustin is like, all right, we're going to have to get out of here and move into the tunnels. And the, the captain starts to argue and Alustin is like, look, dude, all of the defenses that you rely on are based on fucking illusions. And evidently, these things can see through illusions. So it's worthless. You're not going to be able to manage. And at one point when they like continue to argue, he's like, all right, fine. You want to do it? Then go ahead. And I don't want to hear about it when all of you get eaten by giant lizards. Okay. Which is the final, finally the thing that gets them going. Okay, fine. Um, so let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, Captain, you have two minutes to get your crew ready. Then we're leaving. Um, and Godric has to unseal the passage. They get through the opening. And uh, a wave of fire washed harmlessly over their armor. And beside Godric, Sabe launched herself forward. The fire stopped almost immediately. And Godric looked around. The squad of guards that had been stationed there had almost all been knocked down by the explosion of boulders Godric had caused. Only the fire mage in the back had avoided injury. And she was suffering from a sudden case of being impaled on Sabe's new spear. Can I tell you how delighted that line made me? That genuinely made me laugh out loud. <laughs> suffering from a sudden case of being impaled on Sabe's new spear. I don't know why that got me so bad, you guys. But I listened to this section a few times and I laughed every time. <laughs> I don't know why that got me so bad. <laughs> Um, so they head out and the captain just keeps on hammering about how if they suffer any losses of like cargo or anything that, uh, the storm hold better or storm hold sky hold will have to recompense him. And at one point, Godric is like, Alustin, you really hate that dude. 
did you date him? Like, what's your problem? And he gets this weird look and Talia is like, oh, my God, he did. And I had forgotten, like, the way that they were described as being so unpleasant. What I was thinking was that it was like the captain and first mate being dicks to everybody because those were the real captain and first mate. And then the ones that they get sent into the city with are the, the a lust and, and bandon in disguise. But it appears that they were playing the roles of the first mate and captain the whole time. And the others were just disguised from the jump. And so they were watching these two cosplay them and having to just let it go that the portrayal of each of them is extremely unflattering which would drive me absolutely bonkers i will not lie and uh when the captain tries to be like i am not as bad as he made me out to be listens like he's a lot worse than that um so then we have uh this bit with alustin giving them all like orders who's going out who's going left who's taking the bridge yada 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 and alustin told them the rest of the plan and they all stared at him like he was a madman everyone ready alustin asked no one said anything we don't have all day people are you ready alustin got a round of uncertain nods at that let's go then Oh boy, I can't find wait to find out why everybody is flipping the fuck out like this. Um, so we have all of our crew engaging and stepping forward and a step-by-step -step accounting, which I will not do here, of how they each handle various things here. And at one point they are wrapped in paper to keep them from moving forward. And here comes Valia. It's good to see you again, Alustin. I regret not getting a chance to speak to you at Imperial Ithos. And she has also got a Helicotin saber. He tells uh, Godric, Sabe, and Bandon to make a mess and for Hugh and Talia to continue the mission. And then he heads at Valia. So this is when we split off between everybody and get to see the different ways that they are each handling things. Sabe has this spear that it turns out, and I, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, so I should probably wait, but it turns out it's got like a similar ability to Talia's daggers, except like way, way stronger and more badass. So that's why Talia was giving it a dirty look was like a certain jealousy. And I'm assuming that either Sabe found it first or Talia had already decided that she wasn't going to take a weapon. And so she had to stick to that despite this like kind of dope one that seemed perfect for her. Um, and let's see, uh, her armor spun back up and she launched herself shield first at one of these archers still on the bridge before she hit him. She found herself falling straight up into the sky gravity magic so she this, like i can't imagine how incredibly disorienting it would be to, for somebody to just turn gravity off like literally kill me this sounds horrible but she lets herself go up because she's like all right i'm gonna get a bird's eye view here this is cool and i'll also be able to find who's doing it and she sees this woman coming at her and <laughs> This is when Sabe uses her spear. This woman who is trying to defend herself uh, is attempting to use her gravity affinity on the spear to get it to go off course. And it doesn't do jack shit. And this is when we find out that the spear has a kinetic anchor. Uh not only could they mimic the halting effect of a kinetic anchor using far less mana, they also had a second, even more terrifying use. They could stop a weapon from slowing down. Well, technically make it more energy, make it take more energy to slow down, but most mages couldn't summon the power to stop them. And this mage was no arch mage. 
So it's heading toward them and it punches through her breastplate and then her and then the back of the breastplate and it just keeps going past like through which there is something deeply insulting to me about a weapon that acts as if it hasn't just ended your life and keeps going like it's nothing i I, if i'm gonna die because of a badass weapon i want the weapon to at least act like it but this thing is just like nope you weren't even there um and this is when she sees that like the enchantments on the armor that this woman was wearing are flickering and she's like oh god i gotta get myself out of the way and Sabe detonated her wind armor toward her feet all at once, regaining a bit of momentum. She frantically spun up and detonated her wind armor on her legs again and again, but the gravity toward the center of the blast just grew and grew. The explosion seemed to be partially contained by the gravity as well, fluctuating in and out as the two forces battled for dominance, forming some sort of perverse pseudo sun above the canyon, which sounds terrifying. Um, and she stands up and looks around and there are a bunch of people who are like arounding uh, around her, like starting to surround her coming at her. And she's like, all right, here we go. And then we jump over to Talia who is having a really good time, but because she is so absorbed in what she's doing, she doesn't see how much of a hard time Hugh is having with it. So there's a moment later on where they're running off and she's like, tell me that this isn't great. And he starts wheezing, basically. And she turns around and realizes, like, the boy is still fucked up and has to work with him on it. And I was so worried that this was going to, like, lead to a moment of of them being vulnerable because Hugh couldn't keep up or and this may still happen because you know the battle's not over by the end of these chapters or potentially Hugh feeling guilty at the fact that he required this help on the field in the midst of them being in danger and you know he already has this inferiority complex and this sense of obligation to everybody like they uh, like if he doesn't earn their friendship repeatedly they will stop being his friend so i think that i could see him being real concerned at how dangerous a moment this happened in that was a really convoluted sentence but you get me um i feel like this is something that could potentially cause him to sort of like want to avoid battle or be paranoid about it, or I don't know what, or conversely could cause him to take his like attempts at recovery so seriously that he like overdoes it. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so we have this, this bit though, before we quite get to there, um, there's all these illusions that, uh, I think it's Bandon has made of them. Like, to confuse their enemies which are very very convincing and talia is enjoying looking around and seeing all the different versions of herself while Hugh is kind of thrown off by it and she has this uh bone cylinder that is on her necklace that has like this burning oil capability and this thing is so she held it by the edge of the ward and waited for the next chameleon strike to linger the instant one did she jabbed the bone cylinder into the sticky substance on its tongue and started pumping magic into it by the time the tongue retracted to the seemingly blank patch of wall where the giant chameleon was hiding it was already the size of a person's head Nothing happened for a few seconds, and then that section of wall began to visibly distort and shift as the bone fire grew inside of the lizard. Lines of black and brown rippled across the distressed chameleon. Then it exploded, sending burning oil spattering across the cliff face and raining down into the sand below. At least four more chameleons were caught in the burning oil, and their hissing screams filled the air. You guys... I feel bad for these chameleons. I mean, like, they're not evil. 
they're just being managed by a dude who's like in total control of them, it seems like. I mean, it doesn't seem like they have a choice is what I'm saying. And I don't know if that's true or not. It may be untrue. But I just hated this for them. I, you know, um, so Talia, she comes up against somebody who has a windshield, which really fucks up dream fire. So she's a little bit annoyed. And then she's like, wait a second, I got something. And she starts to use a different spell, um, and lifts her two fingers to draw this like beam a line of dream fire burned in two strips along the bridge, and then both of those strips of stone simply vanished. No dissolving into noodles, no turning into fish made of ice that floated in midair, nothing. No bizarre transmutations at all. Weird. The segment of bridge with the enemy mages inside still fell just fine when it was cut free. No one climbed out of the rubble after the bridge smashed into the ground. And, uh... I am dying because like this is when Hugh says I need to drop the starfire beacon. I'm running low on stellar mana and she says that's fine. We've got plenty of light now. And I was like what exactly do you need to do the beacon for? Like did I miss that or is this part of the uh, plan that I don't know what the plan is? Yeah I'm assuming that. So let's see. They Oh, yeah. Here's here's a bit that I really enjoyed. So they have to jump into an area like and and Hugh has made several wards and uh, all of these strikes come at them and none of them reach the two of them. And Talia is just laughing like crazy there. It says she conserved her mana as they ran, only sending one quick burst of dream wasps at a flying mage who was following their path through the air, waiting for an opportunity to attack. She didn't hit him, but the mage quickly broke off his pursuit. And this is the point where she's like, oh, my God, are you OK? And somebody says, well, 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 look at what I've caught. And it is a gas mage, a poison gas mage. And this mage is really like, aha, I've got you. And you can't use your dream fire because you could ignite the gas. And I know that you don't want that. But Talia is like, oh, true. <laughs> Come on. I, I know how to deal with you people. And it turns out that you can have a poison gas affinity, but that only means that you're protected from the particular poison gas that you have an affinity for because there are a bunch of different kinds. So you could just fight poison gas with poison gas. So she has this like thing that they've been working on because they're attempting to create inks for her idea of like tattooing her bones. And there is they've like accidentally stumbled across some things that explode a few times. And so she uses this thing that explodes and creates a gas that is very, very damaging to human lungs. And the circle of stone they stood on, the one containing their ward, simply dropped free from the stone around it as Hugh severed the crystal pattern of stone around it. Um, ma let's see. Mackerel lunged out of the ward into the inky black smoke almost simultaneously with the swordsman starting to cough. So it breaks the thing. And the gas begins and they manage to get out of the way in exactly like the right moment. And I got to say, it's kind of remarkable to me that Hugh knew exactly like how to make this section drop away and understood what Talia was about to do. They are kind of like in complete sync here. And that is significant to me like I feel like that's super meaningful and I appreciate Talia constantly thinking about what a great date this is because like while a bit, that's a bit of a joke there's also a part of me that's like you really get to know who your partner is through going through adversity together and seeing how you come out the other side and I love how well they're working together here and you know, and she's helping him with his breathing and stuff. Like, I just really liked this. 
So then we go to Godric's POV. And uh, he is, I won't say he's feeling himself because like he knows that he has capabilities, but he's not foolhardy about it, you know? Um, and he has this like, oh, you know what I should do is listen to my dad about being the lightning rod that draws attention. And I had mentioned the one woman rave thing last episode when he got this opal and that's kind of what he's doing he's creating this like wildly erratic light system that is super distracting to everybody and i wonder if he could do something with like sound he has his scent affinity so that's also potentially possible but i don't know how that would work here um and there's a moment where everybody is sort of like what is happening and then they start to come at him and he's like enjoying how everybody coming at him at once is resulting in some of them hitting their own people. Um, and there's a moment that I really wanted to mention. Godric has had just yanked the lightning mage off a bridge who unfortunately for her was not a wind mage too. I needed that reminder because I'll be honest, you guys, I fall into the trap of thinking that everybody can just fly in this universe and i have to remember that like people have the tools or affinities to make that happen or get it working for their friends but it is not just like a super common thing that everybody can do so sometimes if somebody like falls i don't take it as a threat because nobody ever really falls you know and to a degree that is true when we're with our friends because of how you can create these wards so quickly but in this moment, I was like, oh, right. Because I'm thinking, you know, a lightning mage, I am like doing the thing where, oh, if you do lightning, you control storms and that means you can control wind and that means, no, 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 that's not how that works in this universe. So anyway, uh, this is when Godric is attempting to grab his hammer and he's using his affinity to like pull it toward him and it's not moving. And he's like, what the fuck? And he's pushing harder to grab it and something else is blocking him. And he realizes there is another steel mage here. And there is a dude who has this armor that he is really proud of. And he has been wanting to test it against somebody significant for a minute. And feels like Godric has been dropped in his lap the son of Archer Wallbreaker the only like the, the, even if it were actually Archer he's like I know I wouldn't be able to go up against him but you this is almost perfect actually so Godric is like all right well bet and he comes at him hits it says literally as hard as he has ever hit anything in his life and he turns around and this guy's armor is just dented. He thinks for sure, well, that killed him. To his credit, I will say that even though Godric thinks that he killed him, he turns around immediately after that strike to face the guy again. He doesn't get cocky and be like, oh, I definitely killed him and leave his back exposed. He turns right away, even though he's pretty certain the guy is down and he is not not only is the armor, the armor just dented, but it begins to repair itself in front of his face. And he's just like, oh, damn. And then we go to Alustin and he is in the middle of the sword fight with Valia and he's losing. And he's like, yeah, of course I'm losing because she's way better at this than me. Thankfully, though, I do not do fair fights. So I'm about to handle this. And we find out that Valia was her family betrayed the Helicotans. Uh, she'd remained in Helicot until the very end, practicing with the sword at every opportunity until her family had betrayed Helicot, bringing down the Echo Ward so that Havath's great powers could strike at the Lord of Bells himself, who is a lich, we find out. Her family hadn't survived their betrayal. They were found out, and only Valia managed to escape the vengeance of the Lord Citizens, during the death throes of Helico, which Lord Citizens is such a weird name, you know? Um, 
And yeah, the reason that she's so good at sword fighting is because the Lord of Bell's specialty is sword fighting. And when he became a lich, that was like part of how he trained is making sure everybody became like the best swordsman in the world. And uh, the fact that a Lustin had manifested this paper affinity meant he got sent away. So he didn't ever get the full training. He is a good sword fighter and he learned how to use this, but eventually, you know, he, he was removed from the situation that would have brought him to the point of being as good as her. Um, and this is when he starts to like distract her on purpose. And she says, are we really going to fight the same fight over and over? And he begins to play for time. And be like, well, maybe eventually one of us will kill the other. But she like destroys one of his paper wings and doesn't stop to or and doesn't press her advantage. She lets him like regain his composure and repair the wing and everything. And it made a little bit more sense as they keep talking because she still believes he does not understand who Candoron really is. And that she can convince him to come to her side and to see from her point of view. And she is saying to him that, yeah, I did betray Helicote, but Helicote was in the wrong. The Lord citizens slaughtered thousands of clerks and other civilians who had done them no wrong merely to sabotage the gears of empire. They drowned thousands bringing down the Alabaster Dam on the Greywise River and condemned tens of thousands more to famine. The man-eating monster you serve is even worse. And I just really want to know more about this because the thing is about the sorts of wars we're talking about is there's no way to wage them without civilians getting involved. Like you, you can't just be like organized on a battlefield in grid formation. That's not how powers like Ithos get brought down. So while I can understand her disgust and rage at the casualties, I also want to be like, what would you have done? Like, how would you have, you know, and I'm assuming this is all, this was all to bring down the ethos, although I may be wrong about that. And then she brings up the people in ethos when Candoran used the exile splinter and is like, you saw the bones. I know you did. And he again tries sort of distraction. And then finally she's like, I can't believe you're still defending her. And he's like, all right, you know what? And he decides he's going to throw her a little bit of a curveball here. And he says, what if I'm not defending her? What if I know exactly what she is, but I am so set on vengeance, I'm going to deal with that. I'll just put up with it. And it really hits her hard. It's like he just said the worst possible thing that she has been imagining could potentially be true and won't face. She just won't admit to herself. And I like, you know, this just, well, maybe he does know. And she just has to keep telling herself because she holds such a low opinion of Candoron. No, no, no. He can't possibly know. He can't possibly understand. And I think what he's saying here is partially exactly the case. But I also think he knows more than he's saying about Candoron's motivations with some of this. And there's maybe something that he can't tell her. And eventually she just says, you don't mean that. I don't even understand why you want vengeance. They busted Helicote, but Helicote fucked you. Like, why do you care? And she, he can recognize she's trying to just get the conversation back to the familiar, but he throws her for a loop again when she says, I would have saved them if I could. And he says, I know. And she stops dead because he apparently has not said that before. I've known for a long time. I wanted to hate you, but you were a child. 
None of that was your fault. But even if I wanted to switch sides, I've killed so many Havathi and fucked them over so many. Like, you know, I can't just come over. That's not going to happen, babe. Not anymore. You are influential, but I am too high profile. Even you couldn't do it. And also, I just can't forgive them for what they did. And she says, you really don't hate me. And I thought that was interesting that that was like, what was so important to her in this moment was so personal, you know, just her being like, oh, wait, I thought that this, this was like you having turned a corner and seeing me as an enemy, but you're saying you don't. And then he says, what if you join me instead? Or what if we just left and abandon this entire conflict? Part of Alustin would always wonder what she would have said, how she would have answered, wondered whether he even actually meant it. I don't think he did. But when Valia opened her mouth to respond, the rest of the alchemical explosives went off. In seconds, every single one of the stone pillars of the sun fence surrounding Dragonclaw exploded, ringing the city in a circle of explosions leagues across. And I don't get, like, are, is the sun fence, like, for, to keep the, the chameleons in? Or what, it, like, this is the thing that I didn't really get. And it says, uh, for a moment it lit up the desert like daylight, then faded just as quickly. And she's like, oh, so you were just trying to distract me. And then they get back into the sword fight. And that's the end of the chapter. So I'm not totally sure what this means. Like, and one of them going off early, why, what did that do? Because it's not mentioned that it went off and like brought down a whole pillar. So I'm, I just feel like there's a whole lot here that is part of this plan and I don't really see it all. Oh, Eduardo says, I think it keeps the sunlings in. That had occurred to me as well, but is letting the sunlings loose, what would that do? I feel like that's just going to cause such chaos that maybe it's not good for them either. Maybe that's why they were looking at him like he was a fucking lunatic when he told them his plan, though. That could be it. Um, all right. I'm going to wrap up, but thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. And thank you again to Dan for commissioning this. Appreciate you a lot. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.